Okay, ladies and gents, we'll get ourselves underway. Um, if I can ask everyone to mute, to mute themselves and um, for those not speaking, if I can get them to just shut their, um, their video off for the moment and we'll go from there. Um, I'd like to open with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. Welcome to the ACT and Region chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association's panel session presenting Dr. Mar Marta Yabra, Professor Richard Lucas and Simon Tedder on, and we're talking about bushfires and engaging with citizen science. Welcome to those uh, that are local and also to those that are further afield, including our overseas um, attendees. Um, the, intend, the intention this evening is to encourage engagement between citizen science and the more traditional sciences um, on the topic of bushfires. You will recall the bushfires of earlier this year and the call for citizen, citizen scientists to be able to get involved in the bushfire related recovery and research. The traditional sciences found it difficult to engage with citizen science um, and to conduct, you know, in there and conduct the pressing science and recovery monitoring that was needed at the time simultaneously. Our intent through this panel, uh, through this panel session is to encourage the start of that engagement now at a, start, a slightly calmer time. Shortly, I will introduce our first speaker, but first, some housekeeping. Um, please stay muted throughout the presentation and for bandwidth considerations, you may choose or may consider turning off your video. Um, I would ask you to do so. If you have any questions during the presentation or during each of the presentations, please enter them into the chat and we will ask them uh, at the end of each presentation. Um, they will also be a, there will also be a group discussion uh, following the all following the three individual presentations. The session today will be recorded, and I will make that recording available in the next couple of days. Now, introductions. Our first speaker, Dr. Mar Dr. Marta Yabra, um, is a senior lecturer in environmental in environment and engineering at the Finna School of Environment and Society, and a research and the Research School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Environmental Engineering. She led the development uh, of the Australian Flammability Monitoring System, a system that uh, looking at the continental scale landscape flammability. She is also the director of the ANU Bushfire Initiative. Um, you may have also heard her on the, on the ABC radio this morning talking about a new, um, a new undertaking that she's managed to organise. I'll let her to talk to that if she chooses. Marta will discuss the importance of field sampling uh, for the validation of satellite derived models on, of fuel load. Thank you, Marta. Uh, thank you, John for, uh, John, for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, hold on. And, um, if I found my presentation. Hold on, sorry. Oh, yes, okay. Good. Uh, I assume you are seeing my screen. That's correct, Marta. You, okay. you can put in presentation, that's it. Okay, good. And um, yeah, again, thank you very much for being uh, with me tonight and with the other panelists. Um, as uh, John said, uh, this is uh, an initial conversation to get engaged uh, with you as citizens in my science, and I'm very excited to be here tonight. So um, I'm going to present some new opportunities uh, for you to be involved in, in research, in, in more, more specifically in, when it comes to evaluate uh, some satellite-derived information that we use uh, to support bushfire management. So before I go into detail, I would like to start with some basics into what are the key aspects that uh, origin uh, are bushfires. So how do bushfires start? Basically, this is uh, the fire triangle that probably you are very familiar with it. For a fire to start, we need a heat source, we need oxygen, and we need a fuel. 
So, and if you remove any of these components from a fire, uh, you won't be able to ignite a fire at all. So today I'm going to mainly focus on the component on the bottom of the triangle, the fuel, because it's most of my research since I did my PhD in 2008 is being focused on, on that. And when I talk, when it comes to characterize fuel, uh, there are three key aspects about fuel. One is the fuel structure and the fuel amount and the fuel arrangement. And the other very important aspect is the fuel moisture content. So this is the amount of water uh, that the plants or the fuels have uh, per dry mass. And it's expressed, expressed with this equation that is very simple. Basically, it's the difference between the weight of a sample fresh, the weight of a sample of fuel dry, divided by the dry weight, and multiply per 100 because it's, it's expressed in percentage. So uh, there are many different ways to uh, retrieve this property from the fuel that is very important for ignition potential and also to explain, explain the, the rate of spread of a fire. And the most direct way uh, of estimating or measuring this uh, variable is with a uh, field sampling and gravimetric metro methods. So this again is the most direct way and accurate but uh, it's not operative in the sense that it's quite expensive. Uh, it needs a lot of intensive uh, spatial sampling. And if you want to get an idea of the fuel condition of a large scale or a continent as Australia, this is definitely not feasible at all. Uh, so normally what uh, field sampling is, although it's still used in an operational content for, for fire managers, for example, they use it uh, before uh, they um, run a prescribed burn to know if the fuel is ready to burn in a mild way or it is too dry that the fire may run out of control. So they still do this kind of field sampling for those kind of decisions. Normally, uh, from a research perspective, we use the field sampling either for validation or the calibration of algorithms derived with remote sensing data. That is another way we could um, retrieve um, fuel moisture content. So basically, uh, we use satellites uh, that collect information uh, of the land surface and we can compare, uh, convert this raw information collected by the satellites into fuel moisture content information, but for doing that, we need uh, some data for the validation or the calibration of the algorithms because there are some modeling behind. Even though the satellite is directly observing their surface, then you need to do some algorithms uh, to convert those values into, in this case, fuel moisture content. So um, we uh, developed, as John mentioned in the introduction, uh, the Australian Flammability Monitoring System. This system was uh, developed uh, thanks uh, to funding from the Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC. And this system provides information about the fuel condition and the flammability of the landscape at a continental scale using data from a satellite that is called MODIS uh, that provides imagery uh, daily at 500 meters scale uh, spatial resolution. And what you see here is a zoom of the system. This product is, is applied at a continental scale for the whole Australia. But here I zoom into the ACT during the Oral Valley fire last uh, summer. So in red, you see areas that are very dry and in blue, dark blue, the opposite. And, and you can see how um, the landscape at, this, at the time that all the fires were happening was uh, quite dry. Even the lighter uh, dark areas in the image uh, suggest values of fuel moisture content that are below the threshold values that normally explain large fires in the past. So the, the beauty of satellite data is that, of course, you can retrieve information. We have a technical problem, Marta. You stopped. It was a lot lower than any other years uh, in report for this specific satellite. Did I stop?
Can you hear me? Like we can hear you now. You briefly stopped. Well, sorry. Yes, uh, my connection is not great, so hopefully it will be heard. <laughs> So we now, have, we now have a slide up that says very dry fuel in most of Australia in 2019. Yes, okay. So I was mentioning that uh, yeah, it was very dry fuel. Uh, as you can see, uh, this um, chart bar here represents the, the minimum fuel moisture content for Australia uh, every different years. And you can see that in 2019, we had the, uh, the lowest values. So with satellite data, you can go back to time and you can look at how uh, different variables, uh, in this case, fuel moisture content have, have evolved over time. So we are now working with Geoscience Science Australia into providing a higher spatial resolution version of this uh, product that will inform more detailed decisions, uh, for example, in terms of prescribed burns. So here you can see uh, the current operational product at 500 meter resolution that is a bit blur when it comes to zooming into a specific area, but the 20 meters spatial resolution product can give you all the detail you need on differences in moisture condition because of topography features and things like that. So how uh, do we, why do we need field measurements if we have these great satellites uh, giving all the information we need? Again, because even some of the methods and the method we use don't need field data for the calibration because it's based on physics principles of uh, radiative transfer modeling. We still need uh, observation for the validation. We need to know if our predictions are correct. So that's why we need to do field sampling. So how do you do, how do we do, <laughs> and you will hopefully do a field sampling um, of your moisture content? Well, the very first step is to collect a sample. And this can be simple or very challenging, depending on what kind of fuel you want to characterize. For example, here we have a shrub that is easy to get to. So you just need a little scissors and you clip the top of the, the uh, plant. But if you want to collect uh, samples from a tree canopy, you need to be a bit more creative. So here we have, a, I have a student that is uh, collecting uh, um, leaves from the top of our eucalypt trees using a huge slim sod. So this is a slim sod that basically you threw a line over the over the branch of the eucalypt tree and you break it down so you can then collect the samples and take it to the laboratory to measure the water content. If the if you are not strong enough to reach the top of the tree or or yeah or the tree is too high, then you need, you can use a cherry picker. Or in some cases, if you are in plants like the sequoia, you need to climb the tree and get the sample. When you get the sample, you normally put the sample into a plastic bag. So you make sure that the, the plant doesn't lose any, any water. And so all the water that is evaporated from the leaf uh, until you are transporting the sample into the laboratory is lost in the bag. So you can still wait it. So then uh, you weight the sample. In this case, this is me in 2006. I was a lot younger there. And uh, you can weight it in the lab or you can uh, in the field uh, with a portable scale or you can weight it in the laboratory. This is a fresh weight. Then uh, you need to put it into the oven uh, for 24 hours at 105 degrees to make sure that all the water that is inside the leaf is evaporated. And then you need to weight it again you, to get the dry weight. If you remember that equation that I previously uh, showed you, um, have the fuel moisture content at the difference of the present dry weight divided by the dry weight. So basically, all what you need to do this kind of sampling is pretty, very straightforward. And probably you already have it on your, uh, in your house. You need, um, you need a phone to take the location of your sampling plot. You need flip lock bags, paper bag, because of course you don't want to put the plastic bags into the oven. You have an oven, you can use a simple kitchen scale a pen to collect, to write down the date the sample was collecting, a few other details. And of course, then you need to have a spreadsheet or a, a field sheet to record the information of the fresh and the dry weight and other uh, ancillary uh, information. 
So even though this sounds very straightforward, I will show uh, later on a few limitations and I'll try to rush a bit because I'm realizing I'm running out of time already. <laughs> um, so this, uh, because of the difficulty to do this sample uh, at, a, uh, at a very large scale, um, uh, a few years ago, I, co I contacted a lot of researchers around the world to compile a huge database of measurements um, that were done by different research uh, organizations across the world. And this uh, resulted in a huge uh, database. But unfortunately, this database uh, only runs until You've paused again, uh, Marta. We'll give her a moment to uh, come back to us. Um, she's still still showing us on on the list of people. I think we've lost your sound, Marta. I might add, folks, that Marta's actually on actually on leave. She's um, come in um, to be able to, she's uh, dialed in to be able to give the presentation this evening. Are you back with us, Marta? Yes, sorry. Um, yes, sorry, you lost me again. <laughs> yes, um, so yes, we have- So you'll, this, need to, you'll need to share your screen again, Marta. All right, sorry. Sorry for the technical problems. I'm in an area with very bad reception at the moment. Yeah. All right. So we, we now have your screen back up, Marta. Okay. So you can put it into presentation mode. You don't hear me now? We can hear you now and we can see a, a map of the world um, with a series of dots and colored um, countries. All right, we should be in the next slide. Um, can you see homogeneous land cover? Or not? Yeah. Homogeneous land cover. Yes, we are there now. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Uh, so, what I was saying in the previous slide is that some of the data that uh, was collected um, that database uh, was not specifically collected to validate it, uh, to validate it. I think so you that... have to have into consideration a few aspects. So it's not as easy to go to your garden and pick up a few uh, branches from your tree. Uh, it's not working. We're still on the homogeneous land cover um, slide, Marta. Yes, that's all right. I think I was talking there. Yeah, I was talking through that one. Okay. Um, yes, so one of the things to consider when collected sampling uh, for um, um, satellite-based products is the heterogeneity of the landscape. So for example, if you are going to validate a 500 meters spatial resolution product, so that means that every pixel in the image is a 500 pixel resolution. Um, you need to collect an area that is homogeneous enough and representative enough of that area. So for example, this pixel here that is a bit heterogeneous, it will not be an area very good for the validation of satellite products at this scale. But when you go to a satellite probe that is, uh, has a more detailed scale, this, um, this aesthetic with forest parts will be suitable for validation. Another um, important thing is that uh, while normally science are involved in ad hoc uh, sampling, 
for this specific um, application, it's a lot more valuable if you are able to collect samples in the same location over time. So you could study uh, the phenology of, of, the, of that specific fuel. So you can see how the fuel content changes over time. And then you can compare that to, um, to the estimates uh, the right of different model approach. As I said, it's very important to consider and uh, to collect the samples. Ideally, uh, you want to co collect the samples at the same time that the satellite overpasses on a cloud-free day because if we are using uh, optical data uh, and, if the, and if the sky is covering clouds, um, uh, the satellite is not going to collect information. And the other important factor to consider is no rainfall. Because if you collect a sample right after a rainfall event, uh, the plant will have water in the surface of the leaf, and therefore you will overestimate the water content of the plant. Finally, just to wrap up, uh, uh, in terms of what to sample, it can be as simple or as complex depending on the field site you set. And normally, you need to collect three replicates of the plants that are representative in a specific location. So in this specific uh, drawing, you see that there are many different plants and many different You will need to collect a lot of samples, but uh, perhaps in other uh, more homogeneous forests, uh, you just need to uh, collect a sample from the canopy and from the uh, grassland layer. And that was everything I will I want to cover uh, today. Uh, this is uh, just a summary of uh, what I discussed, and I will leave it there because I, I am not aware that I went a bit over time because of the technical problems. I hope you were able to uh, to follow my talk despite the the problems. There was there was some technical difficulties as we were going through, Marta. Um, but thank you very much. Um, if we just run through a question or two um, now, I'll just give you, I'll just turn your video. Um, yep. um, we've got a question from uh, Chris's iPad. Um, oh, sorry, that's a statement to say they're a beautiful bin away. Um, we have, have a question from, again, Chris's iPad. Do you collect FMC data from ground or stick or leaf litter, um, as well as the canopy? Yeah, that's an excellent um, question. So uh, the satellite product uh, estimates uh, most of the content of the live fuel. Uh, so normally we collect samples from the living plants, so the canopy or the trees, and we ignore um, are you still hearing me? Yes, we're still hearing you, Marta. Ah, oh. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we ignore uh, what we call the dead fuel. The dead fuel are those twigs or leaves uh, on the ground. Those leaves on, uh, on the ground are very important for fire behavior, but the satellite imagery is not able to, to measure uh, those because normally the canopy is occlusing the signal of um, the underground. Fair enough. Um, does anyone have any more questions for Marta at this stage? Okay. What we'll do now is we'll move on to our next next speaker. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, our, our next speaker is um, Professor Richard Lucas. Uh, Richard holds, and I'm going to try and pronounce these words, Richard, you'll be able to correct me, the Sir Komru um, Research Chair within the Earth Observation and Ecosystem Dynamic Research Group at Aberystwyth University in the UK. Um, and he's actually sitting in Aberystwyth um, this evening or his day. Uh, he has experience in, in quantifying and interpreting ecosystems and environments that are subject to change through the use of Earth observation data from various sources. He has um, progressed our ability uh, to routinely monitor ground cover and change. Uh, Richard will talk this evening on citizen science involvement in establishing a baseline prior to, prior to and monitoring ground cover after a fire 
through the use of earth observation technologies and citizen science supported validation. Richard. Great, and can you see my screen and can you hear me? We certainly can see and hear you, yes. Right, fantastic, good, um, good evening everybody. And uh, I'd like to um, thank uh, the co-authors on this, uh, a few on the call, like Norman Muller from Geoscience Australia, uh, particularly Sebastian Shognart and the Living Wales team, uh, Savannah and Carol and, um, and Graciela and Sophia German from, um, uh, from University of South Wales and Christopher Owens who works with us in Aberystwyth and with Digital Earth Australia. Um, so, what uh, I am going to talk about is how we can um, use environmental variables to, to map land cover and also change. I'm going to explain the basics of how it's done, and then I'll show you how we link in with citizen science. So I'll try and be quick on this one as well. Um, so the schema that we're using for classifying land covers is well known. It's a global uh, standard. It's the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, land cover classification system version two. And it is a hierarchical and modular framework. And I'll take you through that framework um, uh, through this presentation. Um, the main uh, aspect of it is that um, we uh, combine uh, different information or the LCSS does. It takes different information from the ground or from space, but let's say from the ground in this case. And if you go into the field and you look at the things like the life form, it's grasses, shrubs, woody um, trees, and so on. Uh, you can look at the canopy cover, the canopy height, uh, the leaf type, and whether it's evergreen or semi-deciduous, or and then the stratification, the number of layers. And and if you're in if you're in a forest, um, you will be able to say, well, yes, this is a trees. Um, it's closed canopy. It's tall. Um, it's a continuous cover. It's uh, broadleaf evergreen. And it's got a second layer supporting an open canopy of seven to three meters in height. So you can do that. And then a few other things, and, and um, uh, Marta talked about um, fuel, fuel loads and so on, fuel moisture content. So you could look at the vegetation moisture, the leaf air index, the, the dominant plant species, uh, the biomass, which obviously, you know, you have to do post processing of data for that, and put the amount of um, dead material in, in, the, in the forest. So that's what you could do from the ground. So, um, but interestingly enough, you can also do exactly the same from satellites. So there's a lot of satellites being launched and these are just a few of the, of the really good ones coming up. But over time, there's been radar, which gives you information on the structure of forests, um, particularly the, the trunks, the branches, for example, and also a little less so on the leaves, but it can do that. Um, and there's lots of different sensors that can do that. And then there's optical sensors that do, that, you know, retrieve information on the canopy cover. And then you've got the space bond LIDAR that retrieve the structure, the number of layers, the height of the forests. Um, so there's all that information um, can then be put together. And you, you can basically do as you do in the, in the field from satellite. So here we come to Digital Earth Australia. And, and, um, just on Australia has put all of the um, satellite archive um, into uh, computing infrastructure. Uh, it's in Canberra. And you can see now then the changes um, over time um, from 1985. And from that, there's lots of variables that can be retrieved, for example, fractional cover, uh, water hydro period, uh, woody fraction, and so on. And there's lots of other sensors, as I said, that can, can do that. And by combining that, um, those layers through the food and agricultural land of a classification system, we end up now with um, new maps for Australia at uh, 30, 25 meter resolution. And these are entirely built up by combining the environmental variables in exactly the same way as I described in the field. So what it does, it directly connects what you see to what the satellite sees. And so you can start to interact much more with satellite observations and satellite science. And Martha was showing, you know, the, the, the moisture contents of vegetation and so on, that's another layer that could be brought in. The interesting thing then, if I got, because they've got the full archive uh, of, of data in Geoscience Australia, you can look at time one and time two, and you can compare any two years or any two points in time. So they could be a week apart. We're doing annual measures at the minute, but they could be a decade apart and so on. Now, the food and agricultural classification is very hierarchical, but it ends up with these classes here. So initially, we map cultivated, semi-natural, semi-natural, aquatic, terrestrial, artificial surface, natural surface, 
uh, and water, which can be artificial or natural. Um, and that's in time one and in time two. So what you find here then is that when um, something stays the same, so if my semi-natural vegetation stays the same, um, it's all along the diagonals. So your bare surface stays the same, your water stays the same and so on. But if you get a major transition from a natural, semi-natural vegetation through to here to a natural surface, then that's, a, that's, a, that's an off diagonal. It's a strong transition, whereas the on diagonals, it's basically stayed the same. So on that basis, we've been looking at another technology called the virtual laboratory which was developed by Italy. And here you can, um, uh, instead of doing annual changes, you can look at changes um, as and when a satellite image is acquired. So this is a Sentinel-2 uh, imagery from the 15th of January and uh, the 24th of February 2020 and the 9th of May 2020. Now this is, uh, um, this is not the same as Digital Earth Australia, this is a different system. This is based on indices, but the ambition would be to put those into biophysics. But the advantage of this is it's, it's downloaded in um, virtually from um, the European um, uh, system. And so you can apply this technique and do real time changes here. So what you can see there is that the, the basic change, you've got vegetation here, you've got sparse vegetation, so it's still vegetated, but it's given the signal of sparse. And then as you come into the 9th of May, you then got the, um, the vegetation coming back. So you can sort of see recovery in this area. And this is the change of that matrix, which I showed before, which is down here. So what we can do is we can do this um, effect with this matrix of, it's actually eight by eight, for example, eight by eight broad classes that says that this has gone from primarily vegetated to primarily um, uh, bare or bare signal, um, or it's gone from you know, water to bare and so on. So that capacity is quite nice because you can sort of start to see the recovery of or the loss initially and then the recovery as soon as an image comes in. So our system works by looking at between any two points in time. But because you've got other information like life form and canopy cover, you can start to look at, well, has it gone from woody to herbaceous? So has it, uh, if, it if it's off, your, if you've got the on diagonal, so it hasn't changed at all, it's still semi-natural. So it hasn't gone from semi-natural to bare, it stayed as semi-natural it could still go from woody to herbaceous. And then you have another layer called canopy cover. So you could actually say, well, actually it's gone from, you know, um, 80, uh, 80 to 100 percent to 20 to 50 percent canopy cover. So I've lost my, um, my maybe my uh, uh, woody cover and I've also lost my canopy cover. So by simply um, classifying any two points in time using the FEO LCCS, using environmental descriptors, you'll get a, um, a land cover classification and a, an automated change detection system that works between any two points in time and actually it works at any spatial scale as well. So this is what would happen. I'd be looking at if I had a bushfire. So I'd be seeing maybe, for example, semi-natural to a natural surface. I might be going from woody to herbaceous. I might lose my canopy cover from 80 to 20 to 50%. So these are the sort of changes which would indicate to me there's a bushfire um, happened. And of course, you can look at the whole process prior to the bushfire, during and, and after as well. So if we then look at the changes here, we have our original canopy cover here, our original description, which is the trees, closed canopy tall, broadleaf dover green forest, for example, dominated with a second layer. But here, I hope you can see that screen, my canopy cover has dropped by 20%. My biomass has dropped by, um, by about 60 tons per hectare. So that to me indicates, um, because there's still tall trees there, but just the canopy's gone, the biomass is reduced. So that would indicate a dieback. And it's, and it, say a dieback because of a fire. So, you know, you'd obviously have uh, other information that would explain that. And this on the left also gives a little bit of an indication of how the system works in terms of the FAO. So this is like height. So you can go like trees, 40 meters to shrubs, less than 0.5 meters. Um, this is the field description. So you can do these continual changes between all these different combinations in here to build up a, a block of evidence. And it's all based on these environmental variables observed on the ground and in space. Now, what we indicated here was that the, that 
that indicates it's died back because of a bushfire, um, whereas that's the on-diagonal changes. But the off-diagonal changes are forest loss because of a bushfire. And I, I saw that down the south coast where the fire was so intense, you actually went to, you know, to bare ground. Whereas a lot of it is, you, you know, it's, it's, it's still there. It's just, it's, it's, it's not a full canopy cover there. Another example of that is like you've got died back because of bushfire. And in the mangroves, we've been looking at sea level drop in northern Australia. So that's another form of dieback, and that's due to sea level drop. And this one is due to a storm, a cyclone. This is Hinchinbrook Island here. So you can see that they're all dieback. They have the same signal, but there's different causes for each of those. So our change taxonomy, then, we've looked at this, and we look at drivers like climate, human-induced, and then the sort of pressures that these lead to. So climate leads to, you know, um, drought, uh, and then that leads to bushfires, and then the impact is dieback. So what we developed is a, a taxonomy of change that looks at the, um, the impact and the pressure that caused that as well. And so we have this um, new taxonomy of change, which we put in together, which will then be automatically um, mapped those change classes. So now we come to the citizen science. So what we've done, I'd like to thank Sebastian Shognar particularly for this because he's done an amazing job looking, we're working with um, Living Wales project over here and also with Digital Earth Australia using the same methods. And we developed EarthTrack, which is basically uh, allows you to go into the field and record the, those categories in the field, the same ones, the natural, semi-natural, terrestrial vegetation and so on. But it also allows you to do the change. And this is going to be replaced by that change taxonomy of pressures and impacts. Um, as you can see, it's, we've got lots of points um, in lockdown, which are very useful for us. Um, and they're real time and you can download them as a shapefile on this on the website um, and they're as soon as you use the app it will be real time and so if you've got a bushfire for example you want to record something like a tree fall um, then it's immediately alive to everybody in the world so you can download this entire data set now if you want to. I took this down to the bushfires down near Bateman's Bay so and this is John Pring he actually he did went and took some out as well and you can see now that if I click onto that point in the map, I've got my, my sparse, you know, my cover, my height, my leaf type, my phenology and the life form. We've got the site picture looking down, looking up. Um, and then we can see that this is very negative change. This is actually, um, this is Black Mountain actually. <laughs> so this is points here, but this is the hailstorm you had here. And yet this point here is your bushfire. So it's sort of die back, sort of temporary because of a hailstorm, whereas this is due to a fire. So you can sort of see that link between um, impacts and pressures is pretty crucial. Um, so uh, then what that does is it, um, it allows us to validate the land cover maps from Digital Earth Australia. So every time you press a point on your mobile app where you say I'm going to press like canopy height or canopy cover, I'm validating the, um, the mapping of the, uh, of the different variables. So I'm saying, well, this is in the right cover class. I'm also mapping, uh, validating the whole land cover um, classification legend as well. What you can also do at the same time is Savannah Pinalaka here has developed this, um, this uh, app with the Czechoslovakia, where it's the, um, it's the Glana app, which records canopy cover. And so you just have to take nine times nine, and Savannah's done a lot on this, take nine times times measurement in a, you know, at about seven and a half meters apart. And it gives you an automated um, canopy cover estimate. And you can do that in the field with your mobile phone. And that can then be fed into EarthTrack to say, you know, I've used that other mobile app to help me record my canopy cover. Um, and there's a whole manual on that. And again, with Marta's app, okay, you have to go, uh, or her method that she was talking about, you have to take samples back. But if you record EarthTrack points with canopy cover and with fuel loads, you start to build up a database um, of, of information that can be used to support land cover classification and change. So really why is citizen science important? Well the approach that we've taken is we feel that people are out in the field all the time and they're normally recording lots of different things and the nice thing about the FEO land cover classification system is that it deals with water, with urban, with uh, cultivated land. It's the whole land cover globally is dealt with in that system. Our app is therefore global. Um, and, and it also the change taxonomy is also globally applicable. Um, so one of the things that any, any, because there's lots of people would like to, particularly in Wales would do, there's lots of people are using the app. And so it's helped give us a massive validation data set in which we can test our classifications, check change in particular, and go from there. 
So this was the bushfire, I went down, this was the 3rd of December 2020, this was planet data we're looking at. Uh, this is the 18th of February, and I'm not quite sure, I think that's still very just dry vegetation. Ignore this one, this is the Google Earth image, but you can see my points in here. This is the burn sky, I went down the 17th of March before I had to leave Australia. And, uh, and then this is what it's like now, that was like, you know, 20th September. So it's definitely coming back. I noticed that on the 15th of March that this, there's lots of uh, epicormic shoots, but that rainforest is just not, I can't see that coming back for a very long time, but this was really encouraging. And I suspect there's a lot more um, cover in there now. So, um, but it changes all the time. So, but Earth Track allows you to map that change. So there's our change points, they're all negative, they're red, they're negative. But if they could go green, we could say, yes, okay, they're green because this is solid to indicate it's coming back. So it indicates then regrowth. So it's regrowth post bushfire. So this provides an opportunity to not only link and develop the national mapping and the national algorithms for, for citizens, it also you know, provides information for um, a whole range of different um, science topics as well. And it means we find that you know, every time you take a point and you're contributing to global science, that's quite encouraging, I think, and it gives people the empowerment to do something about um, the environment and respond to bushfires as well. So if you're going to, this is another one which is, um, someone's going to talk about like the fires near me. So for example, this tells you about the fires that are happening at the minute. This was um, near Port Macquarie. I think this was yesterday. So but the first track was taken at the same time, then you can still say, okay, my, my prescribed burn did this. And so it changed the cover. It's a, it's a, it's a prescribed burn. Uh, it's a dieback because of the, um, the prescribed burn. And this is the characteristics. I've lost my understory layer and so on. And that helps us then to map the change and characterize the land cover. The other thing about EarthTrack is it can, it's very modular, so you can add in other modules into it or you can use different apps at the same time. But one of the big thing about obviously these fires is the biodiversity. And so you can record biodiversity in this app, but you know, you can use other ones alongside the high naturalist. But what it does, it says that, you know, I've seen um, 20 rainbow lorikeets in this forest, for example. But with using the say, iNaturalist or, or other apps that record nature with the LCCS and the Earth Track, it tells what I saw in this forest here. And then it tells you that actually um, this was where I lost my canopy, the dead forest as well. And the, and the change was happening here, but I've still seen my 20, I might have seen one, whatever. So it links the, um, the, the biodiversity observation with the structural classification and the chain, and that feeds into the national mapping, which can then be used to support um, species distribution models, recovery plans, and so on. So that that's uh, that's my thought on that. So um, it's it's very useful um, uh, technology, I think. Um, in Wales, we have um, we developed the Centre for Alternative Technology. They they saw this, and now we've set up an educational centre there now. And one of the key things is trying to explain that, like hopefully I've done today, explain that to local people that they can, um, how it works and what the importance of satellite data and how everything that we're doing, like Marx's new announcement, how important that is, but how important citizens are in helping them to do something to help us to map the landscape, recover the landscape uh, and so on. So we've got, you know, lots of, we, we, we demonstrate earth track points here. We've got ESA climate change, we're putting the Geoscience Australia information in there, we've got forest plots to train people. And that's a mobile exhibition which could come across um, for all ages really to sort of explain it. And, and so we can put it into village halls or wherever we want to and, and explain what's going on. So that's a bit of an overview and I hope that timing is okay for you, John, as well. Thank you. That's fine, thanks Richard. Um, and you've, you've in, um, encouraged some uh, questions. So if you've We'll just go just go through them. Um, first up, I've got uh, Caitlin Adams. Um, Caitlin asks, uh, "How large is the current Earth Track data set? Are there any problems with people tracking uh, some types of land cover much more than others?" Um, the Earth Track, we've got about four to five thousand points. Um, in Wales, it's been more. We aimed it originally towards professionals. Um, but then increasingly we're trying to find ways to put it into, you know, so school children go out, but obviously you've got to check that, the reliability of the data and so on. So it, it takes a bit of time to do that, but we're hoping to, it's becoming part of contractual arrangements um, with Welsh government agencies and so on, 
to try and get people to come and use that so that they're out in the field anyway so you know let's um let's take some because it's always useful because it surprised me how often things change and are there, are there um, certain types being tracked far more than others types of change um oh, it's every change really i think this the, the change taxonomy is about 120 classes and um and obviously things like in the uk it's like wind throws a lot um we had a flooding it's really big and um, fires as well we have fires over here as well and also down where you are a few things the same sort of things it'd be you know flooding and i guess it's things yeah a drought the and, and also you can do things like crop types um do tree species there's all sorts of things that you can do with it so it's very versatile um, but it's also consistent globally and that's the key part of it it works everywhere in the world I believe Caitlin's question was more aimed at, is there any particular land cover types that are being tracked, that people track more than others? Oh, like, oh, we do the whole, in Wales, we do the whole country. And say with Australia, it's the whole, it's all land covers. And it's, it's those that are defined by the FAO land cover classification system. And you can go into more detail if you want to be more specific, because you still have those environmental variables. So if you're not happy with the categories, you can re reconstitute the category. So it's all land covers, it's all of them, including the marine as well, actually. Fair enough. Um, Vance um, has said, uh, I've been, I've seen similar down in the Magi, um, went down there with Venturous Scouts doing Water Watch. Um, as we are down there once every, uh, sorry, people are entering more questions, I'm trying to read it, um, every two months, um, with the data from teenagers doing um, the sort of um, imagery and so forth that you're talking about be useful? Yes, so the useful thing about the, it's independent of scale because it uses um, measurements like percent, meters, um, t um, uh, yeah, um, time is another one as well. All, they're always like a martyr's measure, it's always consistent over time, which means that you can use them from, I've got that question there, from drones, for example, but also, of course, on the ground. And what we find is that, um, so it's very scalable. So people going down the South Coast, if, you, if you're if you wanting to use it, and you're, it, it's a very good educational tool um, for a start. So it tells people, when I find I'm using it, I, I look at the environment a lot more and say, well, you know, what is there an understory? What's the type of understory and so on? So education is very good, just the app itself. Um, but once you, it takes about half an hour to an hour to get used to it and to sort of understand it. But once you get into it, it takes, it takes about a minute to do each recording. So I think it needs a bit of, it's really good education. So if you've got a group of young people there, if you explain um, how it works, um, yes, it's very straightforward. Um, and they will learn a lot as they go through it. Um, but so we, we use it all the time. So this is this would be a group of uh, fifteen to eighteen year olds. So fairly fairly tech savvy, I would suggest by and large. Um, and what Vance is asking is, as they're going back to the same places repeatedly every couple of months, is it worth doing um, observations from those places to you know potentially show change over time? Yes, it definitely is. If you go back to the same place, and, and particularly when you're looking at bushfire recovery, I think that's very useful because if you're a group doing going down there to do that, and you've got another group somewhere else, and through Australia, you've got people, and also around the world, because they're global algorithms that can support. Collectively, you're, you're adding into that body of knowledge and the data set you know, that you, you've got collected. So the, the repeat measures are really good. And, and what I can offer also is, um, I think when you've got demonstration cases, like I've shown you for Bateman's Bay, by having more demonstration cases, you tend to then get people realizing its power. And so I would, you know, we'll work with you to help to do that, you know. So, and, and if there's any material you want, we're very happy to push that forward as well. Fair enough. Um, I've got one again from Chris's iPad. Um, uh, one of the most drastic changes for habitat in the south uh, coast of New South Wales forests is the loss, loss or change in understory complexity. Um, what do you think, uh, Richard, about the value of satellite monitoring to assess this change? We've got a new, it's called the JEDI. It's a space-borne LIDAR. Um, it samples the landscape. So you've got JEDI, which is covering the whole world, or um, up to you know, the UK and or certainly all of Australia. So that's providing you information on the, the, the strata. Uh, it's, it's a sample tool, so it's not every, you know, it's not like every 25 metres. It's a sample tool. 
airborne LIDO is, is obviously something which is you know, high resolution. That will give you an information of whether there's an understory or not. But I think one of the things I notice, um, and probably a lot of you have visited the bushfires, is it's, you know, you do lose that second layer. And, um, and I also notice that you lose the big trees. I, I found that um, a lot of the, um, the hollows, it was almost acting like a chimney, and a lot of the bigger trees were falling out as well. So you sort of lost elements of the landscape, and that's just from my observation of it. But if you could capture that um, using earth track, and then we could see if we can map it, for example, and it's not just providing support for all, you know, Geoscience Australia or ourselves, it's provided for everybody can use this data, it's all open. So I, I think it's, uh, we can, yeah, I think the information there is definitely in the app to support that analysis and yeah. But okay, we've got, got a couple more questions and then we better move on to Simon. We're uh, sort of running a little, little behind time. Um, Libby asks, you know, can you describe any actions taken on the basis of earth track data? Um, uh, yes, um, we are, well, certainly um, in Wales, we're getting a lot more um, uh, usage out of it. Uh, we're, we're in terms of forestry um, change. So like Winthrow, um, that's the idea is that the forestry departments here are going to use it to re report change in particular, as well as land cover. So that's one element. Um, we see for biodiversity, what we're seeing is a piecemeal uh, decline of most of the landscape, of the landscape of Wales, you know, because of floods and climate really is changing quite dramatically here as well. Uh, and so recording change on that nature is trying to make people aware of those changes. One thing I think is really useful is when you've got restoration programs, um, so let's say you're trying to restore after a fire, is if you've got lots of people uh, restoring bush or they're seeing effective areas being restored, then those points go green and people can coordinate where the restoration is happening or their programs of restoration. And then you can use a satellite to track how that's going. So those are the sort of uses, there's, there's multiple uses really. Fair enough. Um, Vance notes that they've got drone footage um, from some of the um, areas around Namaji. Um, how, he's asking how he how can upload that and where, would it be useful? Yes, yeah, so the best way to do the drone, this is what um, we're working on uh, with uh, here, and, um, but the best way is to try and retrieve the, the parameters from the, the drones themselves. So you can get well, from the um, uh, structure of from motion, you can get canopy height, you can get cover measures, you can get species and so on. And you can recreate the FAO land cover because it's just stacking up the, the variables. So if you can retrieve those variables from the drone, then you can effectively create a, like a you know, centimeter resolution map, which validates the, the, the land cover maps from Geoscience Australia. So, what, so that because, there, because there's independence of scale and time, um, if you fly to your earth track points under the drone, and then you take the drone and classify that, and then you then use that to validate the land cover, then you've sort of got this nice system of validation points. So certainly if there is drone data there, we're very keen to have a look at it. Um, and try and advise on how it might be best to use that data. But I really recommend, you know, if you want to use EarthTrack, then um, to use it underneath the drone is great. And we're trying to get a professional version that works with Androids and iPhones going through in the next, uh, well, as soon as possible, really. Fair enough. One last question, and then we'll move on to Simon. Um, can you integrate with other citizen science data sets? Um, there is a project called Dead Tree Detective um, run out of um, WSU uh, that might be useful and she gives, provides a link. Yeah, so we don't want to super, we, we, every app has got its own value as people spend a lot of time developing those apps. So what we're trying to do is first of all, use the app like Glama um, alongside um, EarthTrack to say, well, what, what is my canopy cover? So rather than guessing it, I've got a much more practical, you know, a definite value that's gone in there. So that's one thing. Um, like iNaturalist, I'm recording biodiversity alongside EarthTrack. So we don't want to like, put iNaturalist into EarthTrack, that's too complicated. So that, so using them together is really good. The other thing then is that we're trying to link in um, the new version, we're trying to link in the databases so that if you're recording something else that has something useful for remote sensing, that would join into the EarthTrack database. And so you connect the databases um, at the end of the day as well. So basically any information collected in the field is used for say biodiversity, but it also helps us in remote sensing to help then biodiversity in the longer term. So I think that's, yes, definitely that's the way to go. 
Okay. Thank you, Simon. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Richard. Um, we'll now move on to Simon. So if I can get Simon to bring up his um, video, that would be good. Um, to, uh, today, Simon will talk about, uh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Are you there, Simon? Can, if you can bring up your video, that would be good. Um, the final, uh, final speaker for tonight is Simon Tedder. Simon is a community engagement officer with the uh, New South Wales Government Biodiversity and Conservation Division, covering the south, southern part of New South Wales. His background includes study of environmental studies, environmental sciences, and working with local indigenous communities, both in, here in Australia and overseas, to resolve local environmental issues. He has also been involved um, with encouraging community engagement in the preservation of the spotted tailed quail and the glossy backed cockatoo. Simon's, uh, today, Simon will talk about his role following the fires earlier in the year, um, introducing existing citizen science um, based techniques and tools to communities in, um, in southern New South Wales. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, John, and um, thanks for inviting me to um, share my experiences this evening. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I guess I'm coming from a little bit of a um, different perspective from Martha and Richard in that um, I don't actually have a, a research project to share with you, but um, rather I'm in the um, business of encouraging um, citizens and community to um, contribute their observations and um, their um, experiences to um, science and so we can improve our management of our environment here in um, southeast New South Wales. So I'll just give you um, a bit of an idea of um, what I was faced with uh, in January this year. Um, there was a, a lot of, um, there's, two, there, there's two sorts of wildlife groups operating uh, after the fires um, and the New South Wales National Parks Service licenses uh, groups to uh, rescue and rehabilitate injured anim animals and uh, um, they were completely over overwhelmed with um, injured and, and, and animals requiring euthanasia from fire impacts. Um, but then in addition to that, there was a, a large movement um, from community members mobilised mostly through social media and they were um, very enthusiastically providing water and food resources for, for wildlife. Uh, in many cases, this was occurring uh, prior to the bushfires um, impacting those regions as uh, you know, the drought um, was continuing to be quite severe throughout last year. And, um, but then as the fires impacted, it really intensified that movement. And as you can see from this, picture there was lots of local businesses and community groups deploying large quantities of resources into natural re uh, areas to support uh, wildlife um, and as the fires progressed into other areas of the state into Bega, into the tableland regions and into the ranges that movement only grew and um, so um, I was sort of deployed from my normal role to support some of the local government and national park services to um, try and uh, provide advice and support to these groups uh, who are um, putting these resources out for wildlife in their local areas. Um, so quite a big area and lots of fire grounds to cover. But I was actually based down in the Maruya Fire Control Centre. Um, so I was talking a lot with um, community groups and local government over the telephone and trying to relay that to the fire control uh, planning teams, the incident management teams, which resulted in some cases in um, accessing the fire grounds to uh, conduct search and rescue initiatives um, with um, trained um, national park escorts and um, licensed wildlife groups to conduct these uh, search and rescues. Um, but it largely uh, involved communicating um, best, best advice that um, we could provide at the time. Um, a team in uh, the National Parks 
service was in based in Sydney were frantically um, trying to provide appropriate information about the uh, feeding of wildlife, um, for species specific food resources. Um, but at the same time, we're also um, conscious of uh, that, that, you know, this, these interventions could have unintended consequences you know, feeding um, animals that are dominant or aggressive may, that therefore may impact on timid or uh, less aggressive species uh, later down the track. And, and also we're really interested to um, find out how effective these water stations were and the, what sort of foods people were putting out. Was it attracting um, pests or um, was it re attracting repeat visitors? visitors? Uh, um, and uh, I also took, um, saw it as an opportunity um, to build the capacity of uh, the broader community um, to engage with citizen science and, and to share their observations while they're out and about what animals were they seeing, uh, which animals were uh, emerging out of these burnt areas in the initial days and weeks and months after the, the fires. And there's so many anecdotes that I heard from community members about um, uh, survival techniques from various um, species. Um, and so it was really important that I thought it was really important that they captured those anecdotes into um, some sort of record. Um, so um, in that period, somehow we managed to get together a couple of um, training sessions to try and capture the effort of the community who were um, distributing these water and food resources for wildlife. Um, uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, they never participated in citizen science initiatives. So, um, you know, it was really starting from scratch. And I think um, if, we, if we're serious about um, engaging the community in our environment and encouraging them to participate in, in our, um, in the conservation of our environment and sharing their knowledge, then we really need to, to make it easy for them. And so, um, yeah, we have to um, provide that um, stepping stone for them into um, citizen science platforms. And given that um, the fires on the South Coast, I, use, I encourage them to use this local um, platform. Um, and it's a um, ACT platform that's um, spread down into the south coast and up into the southern table into the nature mapper um, technology and um, which is based on point records and they were uh, able to um, add a, a water point um, for us to help us capture these wildlife stations and yeah there was a huge opportunity to um, yeah measure the effectiveness of these of these um, wildlife stations and their distribution across the landscape and um, and exactly um, where there might be gaps that we needed to focus on to um, uh, distribute further res resources um, but in addition to that it was for me an opportunity to um, provide a pathway for these enthusiastic community members into the world of biodiversity data capture and to harness the enthusiasm that they had. Um, so it really, um, it really was for me an opportunity um, to introduce um, the community to citizen science rather than um, a research project about the wildlife stations. Um, but of course, um, things don't always go to plan. And um, there are a number of challenges that um, prevented the smooth uh, introduction of uh, citizen science to these communities. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people were really affected from these fires and um, to engage with the wildlife in their backyards and in their local bushland reserves, it really was an emotional response. Um, it was a, a healing from the trauma that they'd experienced and not necessarily associated with a desire to um, contribute to uh, biodiversity um, research or conservation science. Um, 
in addition to that, I guess um, this, the data that they uh, have contributed, exactly what were we comparing it to? Um, because we didn't actually have any data prior to the, to the fires. Um, and Richard and, has touched on this, this and, and I'm sure all of you are aware, there are just so many platforms um, that people are using. So how could we, um, which platform should we use, which would be, um, you know, have a united front of all that um, biodiversity data collected through that um, post-fire period. I guess one of the other challenging things was the political side of it. And, and this, the, the images of helicopters um, on the news distributing food could have, was sort of perceived as a non targeted um, approach and that um, you know national parks um, wasn't wasn't doing much other than just sort of dropping dropping things out of helicopters and and that created um, you know that perception created challenges in the um, communication of our real um, um, authentic intentions to have species specific um, wildlife um, support rather than a broad scale approach. And then of course, um, getting permission to enter these fire grounds was um, almost impossible. Uh, luckily, uh, being based in the incident management team in Maruya, I was able to um, get access to some fire grounds for species specific um, search and rescue for um, the koala population in Biomanga National Park. Um, for spotted tail quolls in um, Monga National Park and and also up in the Jua and Wadbirnga National Parks. Um, but, you know, this was a handful of days, um, um, you know, in a three or four week period post fire where the agencies were mopping up and the community really wanted to get out there and, and, and help the wildlife, um, but they just couldn't. It was illegal to enter those areas without um, permission from the um, fire control. Um, I did. I did want to share with you this uh, one success story, though, um, and it and it's based on a project I've been working on um, before the fires happened up in the Southern Highlands. Um, and the project's called Glossies in the Mist. You can probably probably Google it, and some of you may already know about it. Um, but some of the community members involved in Glossies in the Mist have been taking photos of female glossy black cockatoos. And their unique yellow face markings have enabled these community members to identify um, individuals. And before the fires, about I think uh, this, this group of volunteers had identified, you know, over 70 individuals. And they're actually able to um, uh, they actually photograph this one individual that was named Sunset in Buxton, which is sort of um, in the northern part of the Southern Highlands, and the Greenwater Creek fire um, impacted that area just before Christmas. And, um, but shortly after sunset was photographed again. So um, that information um, proves that these birds were able to escape the fire from. And um, we've also um, since received further photographs of other birds that have been identified and, and they're showing much larger um, home ranges as a result of their food resources being impacted um, from the fires. So, and, and you can see that we've, and, and, and that's um, evident that, um, from the first record of glossy black cockatoos in the Barren Grounds Nature Reserve in, in 28 years. So the poor glossies have, have lost their food in some of those wilderness areas and they're out and about looking for it. And um, the community is helping us um, measure some of these impacts on these species. Um, but yeah, it, it really does rely on the investment um, in, in the community capacity to understand these species and um, uh, understand what they can contribute prior to the event happening, um, rather than showing up after the event and sort of saying, um, hey, have you ever heard of Nature Mapper and maybe you should um, map your water stations and, and report what, what's coming to them. Um, so, with that in mind, um, I guess the next steps 
for us as government is to um, try and tap try and tap into some of the um, community enthusiasm and and build their capacity for something like this going forward. Um, and currently, some of my colleagues in national parks are rolling out a million dollars to uh, in uh, wildlife response um, funding to license and non licensed groups. Um, and they're focusing on sort of uh, wildlife rescue and care. But uh, one of the, some of the recommendations that came out of their um, bushfire inquiry, that are listed there on the slide, um, talk about opportunities to explore improvements in the fires near MEAT. And, and I sort of thought, um, having um, had some discussions with Richard earlier this week, um, that there could, that could provide um, an opportunity to integrate some of the Google Earth engine mapping that you can see there um, with the biodiversity um, data and and also have some sort of traffic light system in the within the fires near me app that um, would allow people to enter some of those fire grounds after the, after the fires have passed that are, that are deemed safe um, and and help um, capture some of this really important information for us. Um, but at the moment, I think the biggest challenge for emergency services is um, managing that enthusiasm in the first few weeks and, and providing safe access for the fire so people can, um, you know, contribute and make a difference, which is, is what they really want to do in those times. So, um, yeah, thanks for letting me share my um, experiences um, this year after the fires. Okay, thank you for that, Simon. Um, certainly would have been a, um, a full on experience, shall we say, from the uh, uh, from that. Um, I have a couple of questions um, from Libby. Uh, do you have a better idea of what citizen science research projects we can do now to collect baseline data for any future fire event? Thanks, Libby. Um, yeah, look, I think um, the baseline data that we need to connect, um, collect is, um, um, is, is, is I think, um, it, it, it comes down to what, what, what do we want to, to know about these species after fire and what does the community want to, want to learn about them? And I think what, um, from, from my perspective, um, I'd really like the community to learn um, about, more about um, the, the resilience that our environment has to fire. Um, and so maybe um, empowering our community to um, investigate beyond the macropods and the, the, common, the common species. Um, and giving them the capacity to um, investigate impacts to um, nocturnal species or um, yeah, flora species that might not have um, fire adaptations. Fair and enough. I think that, yeah. Um, we've got one last question here uh, from Chris or Chris's iPad. Um, will the Environment Trust Fund or any other uh, funds be available to skill local Aboriginal land councils or involving or involve young people through high school um, partnerships in the collection of fire re, um, regency data? Awesome question, Chris. Um, I think um, the environmental trust uh, funding isn't a good one um, for, for those two stake um, stakeholder groups, but um, I'm a huge advocate um, for the uh, Aboriginal land management, um, and and I th and I think that um, our department is looking for ways to to facilitate uh, Aboriginal communities to manage land that will reduce uh, fire risk and also empower Aboriginal um, communities to engage in land management, traditional land management. Um, methods that they'd like to apply to country. Um, and as for um, students, there's currently an environmental trust grant open for education initiatives. And um, 
yeah, I'd love to, if you're um, interested in um, applying for some funding to support uh, student, student science, then I'd love to um, help you apply uh, for that so you can get in touch with me. Fair enough. Um, so that, that concludes the three, uh, three speakers. Um, what we're proposing to do now, um, and we are running a little bit late, so we'll might sort of, if our, uh, if our speakers are able to remain for a little bit, um, we might just make a, a short panel type discussion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Marta has had to drop out. Her connection was just so, so poor um, that she, she didn't think it was worth trying to, um, trying to continue with it. So we've just got, we've got Simon and we've got uh, Richard. Um, so we'll um, have a short group, set, uh, group discussion session. For those um, in the audience, if you would like to raise uh, a topic, please, ra please use the raised hand function um, or type, the me type your message into, it, into the chat. To get things started, um, I'll, kick, I'll kick things off. Um, yeah, yeah, to start off with, would one of you like to briefly discuss how you would see citizen science engaging further um, with the wider bushfire research areas? So we might throw to um, Richard first. Yeah, no, thank you. I was going to, I was going to wait for Simon to answer that one. So, yeah, I, I think it's um, one thing that I notice that people um, they see climate and bushfires and, and, and all sorts of things happening and, and often it's very hard. You feel you don't got the power to do anything. And I feel that, um, first of all, is, is um, allowing people to have that capacity to contribute um, is really important. Um, and uh, connecting, what we found with these, these educational centers, the mobile ones, is that just explaining to people, we, we got a lot of uptake really. And I often feel that demonstration and collective, you know, showing what can be done and the impact of that is really important because often people will take up an app and then they'll use it for a short time and drop it. But what we're trying to do here is to try and say, well, let's have something that's, that builds, that keeps on building, it's always there. It, it, it's supporting the science, and I think that's really important. So, um, and and those you know, you're talking about the, the scouts. Uh, that just even any group that will contribute is really really useful because we can showcase that and 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 show the power of it and coordinating sort of activities like the, you mentioned about the drones. Like if you coordinate the app with the drone measurements and, and make it turn it into something that's bigger than what people realise it is, because. I think that's really good. People, 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 much, people feel much happier about that um, when they can feel they're contributing to something um, like a global climate science or whatever. Fair enough. So that, so in, um, yeah, active engagement across years, but make sure the data is robust as well, um, but trying to encourage people. And a scout group directs in actually because you can train people really. It, it, it gives a good learning avenue for that. Fair enough. And Simon, do you want to add anything? Um, can you repeat the question, please, John? So the, the, the question, just a moment. Basically, um, it was, I'm just trying to bring it back up. Um, uh, it was to um, discuss how you would see citizen science engaging with further, engaging further with the wider bushfire research areas. Yeah, well, uh, look, I think there's a, um, there's a lot of community interest in um, cultural burning um, from traditional owners in our region at the moment. And I, I think um, some parts of the science community uh, want to have that cultural burning regime validated. And um, so there's an opportunity for community to support, uh, the broader community to support Aboriginal communities to help them validate the outcomes of their um, cultural burns. However, I think, you know, that the, that cultural burning um, has to be appreciated um, for its cultural values and it might not necessarily align with um, conservation science. Um, but in a conservation science context, I think um, there's, they're really, uh, the, like just looking at this, uh, Google Earth Engine data that uh, our department released after the fires. Um, it was really quite a, um, a coarse scale um, product. And so there's a, 
a huge opportunity for the community to help us refine um, and and provide context to some of that um, canopy assessment and and a tool like um, Earth Track that Richard was describing, I think could really um, provide um, that opportunity. But yeah, I, I do think that um, we have to really invest um, much more greatly in the capacity of our community to to be able to um, provide contributions to that sort of science because I don't think it's a uh, everyone has the, the knowledge or the capacity to do so at the moment. Fair enough. Um, is there, if you have a question you'd like to put to our remaining speakers, um, by all means, unmute and raise your, uh, raise your question. One thing that we found, if I was going to talk about this, is, is that having a roadmap to how the different apps come together is really useful, I think. There's, there's sort of two things I would say. So, you know, there's all, all the apps, there's a lot around the world, and knowing which one to use and so on, but, and also knowing your data is actually used. Now, some are very, you know, iNaturalist is, is a great one like that, but it's having that roadmap um, of what you want to get from apps in the longer term and how they all connect is good. The other thing that we've been looking at is, um, uh, and we've been working, well, Kristen Williams on the call as well, but looking at what the plan is for Australia as, you know, in terms of um, what you want the ecosystems to be like in the future. So we're doing this for Wales. We're sort of trying to say, well, okay, those environmental variables that we are measuring at the moment, what if we could predict those and say in 20 years time or 50 years time, we want to recover all the fires, you know, the forests that have been burned to make sure they're resilient in the future and have a plan and then trying to bring in the citizens to help you to work and fulfill that plan. Um, so I, I think there's a connection between the two is, is having a look at the really long term because some, you know, in, so in Wales and Australia as well, you're looking at sometimes 100, 200 years to recover some of these ecosystems. So you need a, a really long term plan sometimes. And I think having that, you know, scale of planning is really quite useful. Um, Fair enough. Um, unless there's uh, um, more questions, uh, um, what what we might do um, is we might call the evening to a to a halt. I'd like to thank our three speakers. Um, so Marta, who's actually left us, left the um, the call, um, is has said she's happy for people to express interest if they want to help um, with her her stuff. Um, We've got Richard, who's partly visible at the moment, um, you know, who's talking about Earth, Earth Tracker uh, and the ability to capture um, information via the mobile phone app. And we had Simon talking about the what, what it was like running and setting up and working with citizen scientists immediately after the fires in the earlier part of this year. Um, what I'd like to say is thank you very much. And thank you very much for all of those that have come along and listened. Our next um, next activity is actually um, hands-on in the, in the field type one. We've got a um, bio blitz coming up. Uh, it's scheduled for the 7th of November. Um, should that be wet, then we'll then reschedule for the, um, the 14th. There'll be various uh, advertising um, items coming out in the next little while. Thank you very much, one and all. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Simon. Yeah, thank you for organizing. Thanks, nice. Thanks for coming as well. Have a good day. <laughs>